we appreciate you being here this morning. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started here in just a second. Uh, I want to just make a few quick announcements, and then Brother Bradley will give you the rest of them a little bit later on. But uh, how many of you have seen the sign this morning when you came in? So I want you to help us promote our church, and uh, we got Easter coming up in two weeks, and we want to fill this place up. I'm praying that every chair in here on Easter Sunday morning will be filled to capacity, and we're going to need your help to do that. So I'm going to ask for a few things this morning. When you go out this morning, I'm going to challenge you. There's some cards on the back table for our church. I want you to pick up at least four, and we're going to call this Reaching My Four. And I want you to go to over the next two weeks to four people, and I want you to pray about this and say, I want you to be with us here on Easter Sunday morning. And this is more than just passing out a card and inviting them. This is staying with them. This is staying after them. This is doing everything you can to try to get them to be here on that morning. Now, we're going to be having two services on Easter Sunday. One will be an Easter sunrise service starting at 730. We're going to be having a, uh, a meeting right after the morning message just for a few moments, and I'm needing some volunteers to help out. If you're willing to say, hey, preacher, I'm all in. I want to help on Easter Sunday. I want you to hang around just for a few minutes, and we're going to try to lay out some details and do some more planning. That will be here before you know it. Also this week, uh, in between our, sun, our sunrise service and our morning worship, we're going to try to prepare some food for everybody. I'm going to ask you to bring me two things this before next Sunday, if you can. I need a dozen eggs and a bottle of pancake syrup. And uh, if you can pick those two items up and bring them in, that's going to help us as well. We're planning on having some eggs and pancakes and things like that for uh, during tw between the two services. And uh, we want to feed them. And uh, I believe the old Baptist adage, if you feed them, they will come. Amen. Uh, you know, now for, for the men, I want to say this. Yesterday morning, we had a great time at Cracker Barrel. There was about eight of us that showed up. And uh, we enjoyed ourselves. Now, I'm not sure about the rest of you. You may have been in bed. But we had, we had fun. Uh, and we're going to try to start doing this uh, uh, periodically. And we want you to join us. Harvey looked at me. Where's Harvey? There he is. Harvey looked at me. He said, Preacher, he said, I'm not sure about this 745 stuff. You, you, you need to back it up. And I told him, I said, Harvey, I did. I was planning on having it at 7. I gave you 45 extra minutes. What more do you need? <laughs> so we want you to come out and, and be with us for that as well. So remember, right after church, we're going to have that meeting. You hang around, uh, and uh, we'll kind of go from there and lay out some plans. And we'll start planning. If you pick up four of these cards before you leave, they're on the back table as you go out. Start praying, saying, Lord, how can I reach my four? And how what can we do to fill this this church up for Easter sunrise? Or Easter service, I mean. So you do what you can to get them here, and we'll let God do the rest. How's that? I'm going to open some prayer this morning, and then Brother Rodney and our praise team is going to come and lead us in worship. Father, we thank you. Father, we love you. Father, we need you. And Father, this morning we're inviting your spirit to show up to show out and to speak to each and every one of us. Lord, may everything we do this morning be for your honor and for your glory. Now, Lord, just lead us through this service this morning. Encourage us, Lord, to be what you'd have us to be. Transform us into the type of people that you want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I appreciate that, preacher. <laughs> Good morning, church family. Hope and pray all of you have had a wonderful week in the Lord. I see we've got a few visitors, and to you folks, we say welcome. We hope you feel at home, and uh, you got one thing. Okay, we're going to sing in just a moment, but Sister Sonia has something. Ladies, we had last year, we had our prayer partners. Miss Eden has a card. If you'd like to get with her and get a new card for this come, upcoming year, just want to let you know those are available. So is Miss Eden at her service today? Okay, you get, well, she's going to pass them out in a little bit then. <laughs> All right, whenever you want to go ahead and pass them out, we'll have that done. Thank you so much. All right. Let's all stand to our feet at this time. We're going to go to the Lord and lift up our voice because that's what God deserves. And let's give him the praise that he so honors and he's waiting for us this morning. Oh, how I love Jesus. Let's sing up. Let's sing out and tell the Lord. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing it. Will die 
so good to be in God's house and we have some visitors here today. We're going to take this moment as musicians play, turn around, welcome a neighbor to church this morning. Give someone a smile. Our church choir, if you guys will come and join us upon the stage, and we've got a special we want to share with you folks.
Praise team, stay upon stage, and we're going to continue together this morning. Think about many things as we get closer to that resurrection morning, and the idea crossed my mind this past week. It's just because he saved me. It's just because he saved my soul that he is worthy to get all the praise, glory, and honor that we could possibly give him and afford to him each and every Easter holiday and each and every Sunday morning. And I want to kind of build upon that theme. The songs that we sing today, and I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. We're going to go into the hymn book and sing together that old hymn, Saved, Saved. What a wonderful message that he saved our soul. Let's sing together. say amen. amen I'm saved we're without blemish we're without spot without anything because of the blood and sacrifice of Jesus Christ if that don't make you happy folks something's wrong if that don't make you joyful you're incomplete and I hope you have that joy today number 139 let's sing together at the cross Burning up 
the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Oh, drops of grief can never repay the debt of love I owe. Dear Lord, I give myself away. It's all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there. with us, if you will. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior. The whole Savior, He can move the mountain. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Isn't he mighty, folks? That's why we sing. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. Father Lord Jesus, we come expressing our joy and commitment, God, to the most powerful and most thoughtful sacrifice that could ever be presented before us. Your son who saves. And in your might, in your power, we claim it today, God. We shout it and we express it, Lord, from our hearts. And we communicate that to our community, that our God, that our Lord, that our Jesus can. 
and in your might and in your will, God, we go forward as a church to spread this gospel into this community as a commitment, sacrifice, and our service to you. Bless us today, God. Bless your word that will continue to inspire, anoint our pastor, God, and break bread and break instruction where we need in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you, praise team. You may be seated this morning. I want you to take your Bibles and go to the Gospel of John. John chapter... most prolific symbol of our Christian faith is that of life. And I want to say this to you this morning as we get started, Christ died so that you and I could live. I think sometimes in the, uh, the magnitude of the things that happen to us, the surprises that come along in life, the devil has a way of stealing our happiness and, play, and replacing it with uncertainty. He comes to us in such a way that he robs us of joy and makes us think to ourselves, well, what can tomorrow hold? And I say this so often because I think it's bear worth bearing to repeat and us remembering this. Never forget this. God holds tomorrow. We don't have to worry about what tomorrow holds. We don't have to worry about life. And if we're saved, as we saw about this morning, we don't even have to worry about death. Because at the moment that we take our last breath in this life, church, catch this, we're going to live like we've never lived before. Yeah. I think God wants us to understand that. He wants us to have a victorious life. And remember what I said last week? When the disciples decided to meet Jesus there in Galilee, they went fishing, and they were fishing on the wrong side of the boat. And I made this comment, I want to, I want to repeat it again this morning. Sometimes success, sometimes victory is so much closer than we ought to realize. Because the enemy doesn't show us what God wants to reveal to us. This morning I want to open up a little differently. I want to open up with story. As I was praying about where to go this week, there were some challenges that even the past. And I'll say, Lord, speak to me. Show me how to say what you want me to say this morning. And, and the Lord ran, led me, I guess I should say, to this story. And it's a little lengthy, but I want you to listen because it's going to really set the essence of my message. Our story is about a young boy named Byron. Byron grew up in a tough home. He grew up in a home that contained an alcoholic and abusive father. He had two brothers, three sisters. We could say it was a large family, and growing up, he watched his dad spend their family income mostly on alcohol. And as his dad happened to drink, he would often rant and rave, and that would often escalate to a place of abuse. Well, when Byron was 12, his father walked out from his family. He did absolutely nothing to support his own children. There was no child care payments, no alimony, no cards at birthdays, no gifts at Christmas, nothing but hardship and abandonment. As with most children, Byron couldn't understand why this happened. Lord, why did this happen to me? Six years later, Byron's father shows up once again. But it was two weeks after Byron had graduated from high school. It was an awkward meeting that Byron said lasted for about a half an hour and once again his father was gone. Another 16 years passed and over that time Byron made this statement in confidence to a friend. He said, my attitude toward my dad was everything that it should have never been for a Christian. That man robbed me of a happy childhood. He failed me at every point. He had abused me. 
I hesitate to say that I hated him, but perhaps hatred isn't too strong a word. There was a bitterness that was almost a loathing. When anyone asked me about my dad, I shut them off pretty fast. As I grew older, I put it all out of my mind, and there was a blank spot there. I just didn't think about it. I could go for years without even thinking about my father. He goes on, he tells this story. He said, out of the blue, his aunt called and said, your father is in Bristol, Virginia. <clears throat> very sick, very close to death, and it would mean the world to him if he could see one of his children just once again. He has cirrhosis of the liver. None of the other children wanted to see him, and Byron was the one who lived the closest to the city. He felt this internal tug at his heart to get in his car and simply drive to the city. He said, I had tons of thoughts. I had a lot of strong feelings, just a sense that someone should do this. I didn't want to, but it seemed like I should. As he walked into the hospital ICU, there was a 71-year-old man connected to monitors, tubes inserted into his body, surrounded by all kinds of medical equipment. And Byron, who hadn't seen this man for 16 years, recognized who he was. This wasn't just some man, this was a man that was lying there helplessly dying, strung about with wires and tubes and monitors and machines. And this is what he said. All the years of hatred and anger at that moment simply melted away. He walked over, he stood by the bedside, the man opened his eyes, saw his son, and started to cry. Byron said, I went too. It was almost as though I could, have, I could see going through his mind waves of regret for all of the wasted years. Byron spent that day and the next with his dad. He was surprised to find out there was a lot of feelings that were still remaining for the man who had hurt him so deeply in his life. And in that moment, all the years of hatred and anger were gone, melted away. Byron began to have a conversation with his father. But more importantly, he was able to do what needed to be done. He was able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, not with just his father, but with a dying man. Church, I want you to think about how the Holy Spirit works. Byron's father survived his stay in the hospital long enough to return home briefly. And because of that encounter, Byron was able to go back one more time. This time he went with his wife and his daughter, and it was during that second visit that he began to realize something had changed in this man. Something was different. God had begun to do a transformation, and he could see it right there in front of his very own eyes. He knew that his father had truly trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior. And can, when I say, can I say this to us this morning? When a person truly accepts Christ, God begins to change us in such a way that it's noticeable, that it's evident. No longer was he estranged. No longer was he bittered. No longer was he thinking to himself, I can't do this. I want you to hear what I'm going to say next. When the Holy Spirit began to compel him, saying, go to this man, God knew two things. He knew, number one, that this man needed to hear the story of Jesus. And number two, he knew his child needed to once again experience Jesus. How many times in life has life hit us out of the blue? Has life surprised us? Have things come along that we didn't expect and we question, Lord, are you really there? Lord, do you know what I'm going through? Lord, do you know what I'm experiencing at this moment? And I want to give you the answer to all those questions. Absolutely. And the reason I can say that to you is because God is God and he knows everything that happens before it happens. Folks, this is a true story that I just told you. As I began to research, listen closely. 
As I began to research the life of Byron, this is what I found out. Byron is a gentleman who lives right here in Wilson County. He's a gentleman who began to realize what it takes to understand how God moves and works in our hearts and our lives. And this was his testimony that I was sharing with you. So often when we fail at releasing the past, releasing the things that hurt us, when we harbor the pain that's been inflicted on us, when we don't let go of some things, when we don't, or we're not, maybe is a better way of saying it, we're not willing to forgive those who hurt us. Do you realize we carry that pain so much longer in our life? And let me tell you what the devil does in, the, in those moments. The devil robs us of the life that Jesus died to give us. Lord knows what we're going through. And he wants us to live that life with complete trust in him and what he has accomplished for us on the cross. Last week we saw the only recorded miracle of Jesus after his crucifixion. He had told these disciples, he said, I want you to show up. I want you to meet me there in Galilee. And if you remember from the story from last week, when Jesus showed up, they were there and they were fishing. They had toiled, they had labored, they had caught nothing. I am sure in that moment, they're thinking to themselves, Lord, enough's enough. You ever been there? I have. And I'm willing to say that just about everybody in this room has been there as well. But this is the lesson that I think the Lord wanted to show them on that day. If you will only trust me, I can change things in your life. And I can teach you this important truth. Love will always conquer all. Do you realize in this world there are hurting people in every walk of life. And the one thing that every single person has in common is this. They all want to feel loved. The person who's went through the divorce wants to feel loved. The child who has been abandoned wants to feel loved. When you get in an argument with a family member or your spouse, when you make up, do you know what you're wanting? You're wanting to feel loved. And as I begin to pray about where to go this week, I want to show you how God works because I really hadn't looked at what we were even singing this morning, but God always knows what he's doing. I was sitting back there in my office and I was thinking to myself, and God began to lay this song upon my heart, Oh, How I Love Jesus. And I picked up the hymnal in my office. It's laying there in the front row. I said, you know, I think this would be a good song that we should sing this morning. And I took a little paper clip in there on page 217, and I said, I think I'll just maybe look at Rodney, or maybe I'll just sing it myself. And Rodney gets up here this morning, and what's the very first song he sings? Oh, how I love Jesus. Everything that he talked about was the cross. Everything that he talked about was the love that Jesus has for us in those songs that God led him to. And I want to say this to you. God always knows what he is doing, even when we don't. Obedience to Christ will always release blessings from Christ. That was what he was speaking to when he first showed up and when their nets were empty. And in that moment, success came when they began to follow and they began to listen. But in order for us to find the same type of success, and I want to put this out there to all of us, sometimes we have to let go of what happened and start looking with an expectation for what God can do. I want you to think about my next question just close to for a second. There's not a doubt in my mind that every single person that's sitting here this morning has been through something in their life that they wish they could change. But here's what I'm going to tell you next. You can't. But you don't have to harbor that all your life to the place that you miss the life that Christ wants you to have. You don't have to miss out on the love that Christ offers to each and every one of us. You see, Peter and these disciples showed up, and, and I guarantee you they were not singing the song, Oh, how I love Jesus. 
when they arrived in Galilee and knowing Jesus was coming, it was probably more like, oh, how I really messed up. Oh, I wonder what Jesus is going to do when he gets here. Oh, I wonder what he's going to have to say to me now. And Jesus is going to show to them that I haven't abandoned you. I haven't left you. I was with you the entire journey. I stayed beside you all the way along the way. And the immense amount of pain and concern and regret that you are carrying right now is not because I'm telling you to carry it. It's because the enemy is keeping it on your shoulders. And he says, I want you to release that. I want you to give that to me. But in order to release that and give that to me, you have to be willing to look the Savior in the eyes. What do you think Peter and those other disciples were thinking at the moment they fixed their eyes upon Jesus? I imagine it was something like Byron's father was thinking the moment he fixed his eyes upon his son. And the regret for what he had lost the things that he had done probably flooded his soul. But here's the good news. The love of Jesus is like no other love. And it can be a healing love. And the love of Jesus, when embraced, can repair the damage that's been done in, over time in all of our lives. And this would be the lesson that on this day that we're going to talk about, Peter would learn. Look with me in John chapter 21. Typically, I'd have you stand, but I'm going to let you remain seated this morning. And I want you to start following along with me in verse 9. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said, then bring some of the fish which you have just caught. So Simon Peter went up and dragged the nets to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he raised them from the dead. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and you walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. Imagine with me this morning that Jesus Christ was to walk into this church. He was to stand here on this platform behind this podium and he was to look at every single one of us individually and ask us the same question he asked Peter. And if he looked us straight in the eye and he said, do you love me? I'm willing to say that probably, if not all of us in this room would look at him and say, absolutely, Lord, you know that we, we love you. But can I tell you that love is more than just a word? Love is something that's meant to be revealed. And on this day, Peter was going to understand this truth in its fullness. You see, this lesson that Jesus was going to teach would not be taught with words. It's going to be taught with actions. He's going to show them that through service, through what I do for you, I'm going to show you how much I love you. Catch what I'm going to say next. Do you realize that's exactly what took place on a cross? Jesus revealed his love for all of humanity. Jesus revealed his love for you and I. Jesus died on the cross so that anyone who would put their faith and trust in him could receive that gift of salvation so that they could go to heaven. Yet so often what we do if we're not careful, and many of the lost in this world are doing this, they back up and say, 
He can't save me because of what I've done. I'm not convinced that anybody has ever done anything any worse than what Peter had just done. Peter had said, Lord, I'm willing to die for you. Lord, this is how much I love you. Peter pulls out a sword and he's ready to fight to the death in that moment. But when Peter is confronted with the truth, when the devil shows up, when the devil kicks the wind out of him, when he sees his Savior going to a cross, beaten and maimed, and they say, you're one of his disciples. Peter said, oh no, not me. Now ladies, would you get upset if your husband was to do this? Well, ain't you married to her? Oh no, she's not my wife. I can promise you this, somebody else is getting ready to die. Men, imagine you've done this three times and your wife knows. And then you come home. You don't walk in and go going, well, how was your day? Because the first time you do that, you know what she's going to say. Sit down, buddy. We need to talk. And you just hope and pray and she ain't got a frying pan in her hand. Peter's standing there in that moment, knowing what he's done, knowing what Jesus had done on the cross, knowing that Jesus had just died for him, knowing that Jesus had told him, you're going to do this, knowing that Jesus knows all. And now Jesus stands in front of him and says, do you love me? Notice with me, first of all, if you have your outlines there in your bulletin, you might want to write these down. It's from a heart of love that Jesus served his disciples. Look at verses 9 and 10 with me again. Then as soon as they came to land, they saw a fire of coals there, fish laid on it, and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have caught. So they get back to the shore, and it'd be easy for us to overlook this, but Peter looks out there, and he smells something. I mean, how many of you ever walked into your house when, you're, when your wife's been cooking something and you ain't even made it to the kitchen yet, but you already know she's cooking something? Sonny gets mad at me at the house when I cook bacon. She said, that smell lingers around for like three days. I'm fine with that. I like the smell of bacon. So here's Peter. He gets to the shore and he smells these hot coals. He smells these fish that are cooking. And Jesus looks at him and says to him, Hey, bring some of what you've caught. Now, let's back up just a little bit. Because you remember from last week, Jesus had asked me, have you caught anything? He already knew the answer to that question as well. And when they get there, he, Peter smells something already cooking. They were toiling in labor trying to, to get these fish to shore. And anybody in their right mind should ask this question. Where did those fish come from? You see, we could overlook that. Now... The answer to that question, I want you to catch what I'm going to say next, really doesn't matter. That's not the question that we need to be paying attention to. That's not even the statement that we need to look at. What we need to realize in this moment was the Savior, the Lord of all, the one who had died on the cross, the one who had been resurrected from the dead, the one who had told the disciples, I'm going to meet you here in Galilee, the one who told them how to fish and where to fish, He's already there, and he's already cooking in that moment. Why? Because he knew they had toiled all night. He knew in that moment that they were hungry. And he said, I want you to realize just how much I love you. Now, I'm not the smartest man in the world, but I've got a feeling that if I went to a foreign country where there is kings and queens, that if I showed up, the king or the queen would not be preparing me a meal. I don't even believe that they would have their staff preparing me a meal. And if I can say it in this realm, in this way, just for a moment, they probably would not even care who I am. But Jesus looks and sees these hungry men. He's attempting to say, I love you. And regardless of what you have done to me, Love 
conquers all. Think about what was taking place. Maybe Peter looked out and he sees all these fish laying there that Jesus is preparing for the meal. And maybe he does question just for a second. I wonder where they came from. And then he begins to remember who Jesus is and how Jesus operates. Because you see, Peter was there when Jesus was introduced to a little boy with a few sardines and a few crackers. And little as much when God is in it. And he was able to feed the multitudes. And he realized in that moment, I believe this, that while Jesus was wanting the people to see who he was and what he wanted to give them, Jesus also saw their physical need in that moment. He saw them as hungry. He said, I want to feed you. I want to show my love to you. I want to reveal this to you so you can see when the time comes and I go to the cross just how deep my love is for you. How did Jesus do what he did? Where did these fish come from? Now, we talked about the miracle that was recorded last week, it being the only recorded miracle after the resurrection of Christ. Could this have been a second miracle? I'll let that, leave that to you to figure out. Jesus, in that moment, was trying to expose this truth. I want you to know how much I love you. And it's out of the deep love that I have for you that I'm willing to serve you. Can I say to us this morning that when we as God's children begin to see through the eyes of Jesus, the way that he sees, it'll start to change us. It'll start to transform us. It'll start to make a difference in who we are. We'll put a Side the past and we start serving like he did from a heart of love and the only way we can serve like he did is through his power and through his love but then notice secondly this it was from a heart of love that he taught his disciples Jesus had been serving he had been feeding and then he moves on to from a group to an individual. Now keep in mind, we're going to talk about Peter here just for a second, but keep in mind, the other disciples, or at least part of them, were there as well. All of them had come in. When they all got there, they all sat down, they all began to eat together, they began to partake of the meal. And I don't want you to lose this fact that even though Jesus is going to divert his attention away from all of them, on to Peter, they all sat there listening to what was taking place. Look what the Bible says, beginning in verse 15, So when Jesus had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, Do you love me more than these? Be easy to miss this. Jesus could have stopped at that moment and said, Peter, do you love me? Question mark. But Jesus added a caveat to what he was saying. He said, do you love me more than these? And as Peter is sitting there with all of his brothers in Christ, I believe all eyes were focused on him. In that moment, Peter was being called out, kind of like I called out Harvey this morning. All those eyes were looking at Peter. And it'd be easy to say, why did he do that? But you've got to keep this in mind. Those same eyes were also fixated on Peter when Peter said, Lord, I'll never deny you. Lord, I'm willing to give my life for you. In that moment, Peter's at a place where he's broken, wondering in his heart, Lord, can you ever use me again? And God was going to show that when his love is in, involved, he has the ability to fully restore us. 
And in that moment, he's forcing Peter to make a public proclamation, just like he had made the first time. He looked at Peter. He said, Peter, do you love me more than these? And Peter said, Lord, no, I do. He looked at him a second time, and he said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, Lord, you know all things. Lord, you know I do. And Jesus looked at him a third time. How many times did Peter deny Christ? Three. And he says, do you love me? And I think in that moment, the Holy Spirit touched Peter's heart in such a way. He realized why Jesus asked him three times. Because he said, you denied me three times in front of men. If you really love me, are you willing to tell everyone around me three times how much and how deep that love really is? And it was in that moment that Peter was restored. I wonder if the devil showed up on that third time and said, Peter, Jesus knows what you did. Are you really going to stand here and try to affirm to him that you love him? Peter, if you if you'd have loved Jesus, then, then why did you deny him? Peter, you had the, the opportunity. Listen to what I'm going to say next. Jesus Christ is not worried about what you've done in the past. He's more concerned about what you're going to do in the future. And Jesus had already told him, he said, Peter, up on this rock, I'm going to build my church. Peter, it's going to be through what you do. That's going to make all the difference in the world. But Peter, if you can't tell me you love me with me looking you in the eye and this group of men standing right here beside of you, how will you look at them and tell them you love me? You see, the devil doesn't care when we say to ourselves, oh, how I love Jesus. But the devil gets real concerned when we start showing the world how much we love Jesus. When we begin to develop his heart and see through his eyes and that love begins to come through us and we begin to, to serve others. Verse 15, Peter's looking at him that third time. He says, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Perhaps a better way of understanding this would be to say it this way. Peter, if you love me, prove it. Men, when you looked at your wife, before she was your wife, and you said, I love you, somewhere quietly, in that conversation, this statement was being made. Then prove it. And then some of you walked into a jewelry store and you were thinking, do I love her that much? If you go study this, in, this story in its Greek, Jesus was using the form of the Greek word of love called agape. And he's looking at Peter saying, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter was responding with another form of the Greek word called philio. And that Greek word philio is where we get our city called Philadelphia. How many of you know what the city of Philadelphia is called? A city of what? Brotherly love. And Peter was saying, Lord, I love you like a brother. Jesus asked him a second time, Do you agape me? And Peter, for the second time, says, Lord, you know all things. I love you like a brother. Now stay with me. Imagine me looking at my wife, and she says, do you love me? Oh, I love you like a sister. That wouldn't go real well. 
But Peter hadn't called what Jesus was saying yet. So the third time, Peter, Jesus looks at Peter and he says, Do you phileo me? Do you love me like a brother? And then it clicked. Jesus wasn't saying, I don't want you to love me like a brother. I want you to love me like I loved you. I want you to be willing to give your life for me. I want you to think about what I had to sacrifice in that moment. I was willing to give up everything for you. So church, let me ask you once again, if Jesus was to walk in and say, do you really love me? Before you answer that question, you better remember this. Words are only words, but actions speak louder than words. And we have to realize how deep is that love because the love of Christ was put on full display. And in this moment, Peter and this interaction, this discord is taking place. Peter is on full display for all the world to see. But there's one more lesson that I believe that the Lord had in store for these men. And it was from the heart of love that Jesus desired to transform his disciples. Look at verse 18. After looking at Peter three times in front of all these men and said, Do you love me? Do you love me more than these? Do you love me? Notice what Jesus says next. He said, Most assuredly I say to you that when you were younger. Now, let me stop there just for a second. Because often when we think of young children, we also think of immaturity. And if I could say it to us in this way, this may make more sense. I say to you, when you were immature, you girded yourself and you walked where you wished. But when you are old, when you've matured, when you've stretched out your hands, another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. We may not like it, but as we age, we begin to realize we can't do what we once did. And I am there. And the more I talk to some of you who are older than me, you keep trying to encourage me saying, that, oh, it's only downhill from there. <laughs> Thank you for encouraging your pastor like that. Each of these men... We're in that moment, and Jesus was trying to say, you made the mistake that you made. You made the mistakes, if I can pluralize that just for a second, that you made because you're still growing in your faith. And I recognize that, and I realize that. But the closer that you walk to me, and the more that I begin to change you and transform you into the person that I want you to become, you're going to grow in your faith, and that faith is going to change who you are, what you do, how you serve, the way that you see this world. Your desires will begin to change. No longer will it be about what you want, it's going to be about what I want you to do. And to make his point known, Jesus is trying to show them this. He said, look, when I came to this world, when I was born as a baby, when I suffered and went through the abuse that I went through, when I went all the way to the cross, that was not what I wanted to do. That was what my father wanted me to do. And I was willing to submit myself to my father's will. And he's looking at these guys and said, if you love me the way you claim you love me, you're willing to die to what you want and you're willing to say, your will be done, Lord, not mine. I'm willing to show my love for you. One of the quickest ways we reveal just how much we love him is when others see his love in us on display and they look at us and go, why are they doing what they're doing? Jesus loves me. This I know. Sounds good when you sing that song and we often think of that as a song for children, but Stay with me. No, that's a song for adults. That's a song for maturity. Because when we're immature, we are self-focused. When we are mature, we say, Lord, you lead me, you guide me. Wherever you send me, I will go. Isaiah did it best. Lord, here am I. Send me. Many of the Old Testament prophets, sometimes they didn't like to do what God told them to do, what they said. 
Lord, hear my sin me. And can I say this this morning? I think what this world needs to see today more than anything else is not Christians who say they love Jesus, but Christians who are proving they love Jesus. They're willing to do what he wants. You remember the story about Byron's father? He abandoned his own children because his desires were the most important thing in his life at that time. And he took him all the way to almost the point of death before he was willing to face the truth and the reality. I've messed up. I've walked away. I've turned my back. I've did these things that was wrong. But stay with me. Byron's father did nothing different than what the disciples did themselves. When Jesus was on the cross, do you know where they were all at with the exception of John? Nowhere to be found. They had run. They had hid. Maybe they didn't verbally refute being a follower of Christ like Peter did. But once again, actions speak just as loudly as words. Christ wants us to grow. He wants us to mature in our faith. That transformation takes place inside of us. And all of a sudden, we are a force to be reckoned with. And when God starts to transform us, when he starts to work, when the Spirit gets inside of us and starts to move us and guide us and direct us, I don't want you to be oblivious to this fact. The devil turns up the heat. The devil comes after us. The devil starts to whisper in our ears about what we've done. And when the devil starts whispering in our ears about what we have done, can I say this? We need to remind him what Christ has done. And because of what Christ has done, we should have a hope and an expectation of the greatest days are still to come. Paul said it this way, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul said it this way, if I can paraphrase that. Devil, I've got nothing to lose. It's all uphill from here. Yes, I've made my mistakes. Yes, I fell flat on my face a few times along the way. Sometimes I know that I do the things that I shouldn't. I struggle in those areas. Paul and all the other disciples are just like you and I. They still did things wrong. But they were able to mature and grow and learn from their mistakes and pick themselves up and said, Lord, work inside of me. Change me to what you want me to become. Transformation always brings a change. Sometimes that starts with a change of attitude. Sometimes that starts with a change in action. Sometimes that starts in a change in thinking. But I can promise you this, it will always start with a change in our hearts. That's when we open the door and we let him in. Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Do you know what he's knocking for? He said, if any man will open up and let me in, I'll come and sup with him. I will change him. I will give you a new direction in life. You see, these disciples knew what Peter had done. I, I, I want to promise you this. This world knows what you've done. And I can promise you this even more. Your family really knows what you've done. And Lord love our families. They often remind us of that, don't they? But Jesus is not concerned once again with what you've done. Jesus is concerned about what you're going to do. And Peter is sitting there in that moment knowing that he denied the Lord. And the Lord looks at him three times and says, do you love me? And he says, yes. And he says, well, get up and prove it. 
Go into the city, stay in Jerusalem, and when the Holy Spirit shows up, I'm going to show you what I want. And there in Acts chapter 2, I believe it is, the Holy Spirit shows up, and Peter stepped up. And then Peter opened up. And Peter began to share the hope that Jesus brings. And on that day, the Bible says that thousands literally gave their life to Christ. Here is a man who once was broken, who has now been restored. Here's a man who was living in the past that God says you still have a future. And church, I want you to realize regardless of what we've done, we need to get out of the past and start looking to the future, wondering what can God do with my life if I only allow him to. You see, when the Holy Spirit began whispering to Byron and said, you need to go visit your dad, and the devil showed up and says, why did you want to do something like that? God knew two things. God knew he needed a Savior. And he said, Byron, you need to know who I am. Are you willing to trust me? Are you willing to follow me? Are you willing to say what I want you to say, even with someone that maybe has hurt you? And in your heart, you feel like, I just can't do this. Church, he showed up. In that moment, the Holy Spirit was able to fix a lifetime of issues. Do you know what we need in our lives more than anything else? We need the Holy Spirit to show up and say, Lord, fix a lifetime of problems. If the love of Christ gets a hold of us, the love of Christ will change us. And it's the love of Christ and only the love of Christ that can fix the past and restore future. And if we allow the love of Christ to get into us, then our love for him become more than just mere words. We are there. They are on display. They're put into action. So can I ask you this morning, do you really love the Lord? Because if you say, preacher, yes, then I believe what we need to start doing is proving it, putting it into action. What's stopping you this morning? Is it bitterness over something that's happened? Is it anger, past regrets? Is it someone who you just can't get past? Someone who's done you wrong? Is it the mistake that you made and you say, oh, man, I wish I could turn back time? You can't. But that doesn't diminish the love of Jesus for us. And what we need more than anything else made to be simply like Peter and say, Lord, you know I love you. You know all things. And Lord, if you'll just give me another opportunity, Lord, I want to prove it. True love will always make the first move. Preacher, what do you mean? Jesus started serving before he ever went to the cross. And then he came back still serving to make a point. He wanted these guys to know that even before I died for you, I already loved you. John, the beloved, the one who was there at the cross, the one who saw everything that took place, said it this way. We love him because he first loved us. And if you want to feel the transformation power of God's love in your life, it happens when you realize what he did for you on the cross. Byron realized that. Byron said to his father what needed to be said. His father gave his life to Christ. And I want to present you with one single question this morning. And we're getting ready to go into a time of invitation. 
What in your past is worth allowing the devil to take someone else to hell over because you would not release it to him? God has a plan for you and I. God wants to use you and I. But transformation always starts in obedience. And then it's always revealed in love. Jesus said, I love you this much, I died for you. Let's go back. Look at verse 17 with me. Jesus said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And at that moment, the Bible says Peter was grieved because he said it to him the third time. How many times in this life does the Lord Jesus have to show us just how much he loves us? I suggest to you the only time that it should take is once on a cross. But every single day when God meets your need, when God allows you to get out of bed, when God allows you to accomplish the things that you accomplish, when you look at your house, your car, your homes, the food that you have, all the blessings that he bestows upon each and every one of us every single day. Do we stop and say, Jesus loves me, this I know. If we're going to stand up and we're going to say, oh, how I love Jesus, maybe what we need more than anything else is to also say, Lord, let me prove it. Change me. Use me. And let me become what you want me to be. That's when the love of Christ is on full display. Let's all stand to our feet. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm going to ask the musicians to come. This morning, maybe you're here and maybe you've never met the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I want to say this to you. Jesus loves you. He died on the cross so that you could spend eternity with him. And all you need to be willing to do is step out and take trust in by faith. If that's you this morning, I'm going to challenge you and encourage you to come. I'll be glad to talk to you and tell you how you can meet this Lord and Savior of mine. If you're here this morning and the Holy Spirit is talking to you and showing you some things, maybe he's challenging you to prove it. You may need to step out and come and fall down at this altar. You may need to sit down right where you're at. You may need to say, Lord, I need you to start working in me. But Lord, more than anything else, Lord, I want you to be in control. Father, Lord Jesus, best I know how. Lord, I have said everything that you've told me to say this morning. Lord, I ask that you just work during this time. We ask that the Holy Spirit just move and speak to each and every individual to the things that you would have them to hear. Lord, whatever it is, whatever you're asking, Lord, let our folks be willing to say, Lord, I'm all in. Lord, let me prove to you once and for all what we can do. And Lord, I believe this church can accomplish so much that our best days are ahead of us. All we have to do is look to the future with anticipation. Now, Lord, I turn this invitation over to you and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Hey, thank you for the word that was presented to us today, Lord. Let it sink in our hearts, Lord. Let it, let's use that. Let's go out and just remember who you truly are and what you mean to us this week. We just thank you again for um, using these tithes and offerings now to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Choir 430 this afternoon, please remember that. Folks, if you've been here long enough, you haven't figured out we are a family. Look around. If there's somebody not here, that's because they're dealing with something. Some people are in rehab. Some people got out of surgery. Some people are struggling. Would you make it a point this week to pray for our church family? Pray for our people. Strengthen them in prayer. Strengthen their spiritual bones and ask God to reach out and touch them and strengthen us in unity as we go forward in the will of God. Stand to your feet. We'll be dismissed in a song. I'm going to ask you, if you would, grab somebody's hand, tell someone you love them, and let's sing out and ring out the family of God together. Grab a hand as we are dismissed. Sing out together. Let's sing. Oh, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain. Oh, cleansed by His blood. Join in the Jesus as we travel this spot. For a part of the family, the family of God. God bless you. Have a wonderful day in the Lord.